Okay, here we are live on the internet. Um, welcome if um, you are um, watching this at whatever point in time. Um, we are having this um, conversation today about feedback and debriefing or um, what's that cool, um, the end of game is a kind of like how we handle um, things at the end of the game and where we want that um, to lead. And I guess it's kind of about um, how we care for each other as well afterwards. I guess how we make, like, it's a combination for me of how we make our games better and how we care for each other better. I think that's probably a nice way to sum it up. Um, the conversation is happening as part of um, GauntletCon. 2018. Um, so the um, sorry, did I hurt all your ears with my baritone there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the um, which is an online convention put on by the Gauntlet um, tabletop RPG community and online LARPs <laughs> community. It's more happening. More I can see Sid. Um, yeah. So um, we kind of just had a little orientating um, discussion about um, how we're hoping to do this and kind of decided it will probably be the start of an ongoing um, conversation. We're not expecting to like solve <laughs> anything that much today, but kind of talk about our ideas. Um, I'm definitely like pretty new to both feedback and um, debrief and and why and how we um, do that. And I know that there's a lot of ideas out there about how to do it. Um, I had originally intended this to be a kind of a two hour thing and we would start to maybe workshop new um, techniques and things, but hopefully today we start to get some of those tools and ideas out on the table that we would we would do that with. Um, do we want to do a quick little, actually, I've got a cool idea about um, how to begin this, I think, which might be a little um, round table. I'll just call each person um, what maybe what, um, what you currently do at the end of your um, online game, like what your end of game currently looks like. Um, does that sound good to everyone? Go like this if it sounds good. Go like this if it sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll start um, myself. Um, I currently, at the end of a game, um, do Stars and Wishes, which is a thing that um, I... Um, it's kind of a... Um, philosophical shift of how I understood um, Roses and Thorns to work. So it's directing the idea of the Thorns in particular in Roses and Thorns into a looking towards the future rather than looking at what has just happened in the game and a, from a, also a potentially negative light just because of the word, like just because of Thorns and how they catch you and shifting it towards like a bit of a softer and forward looking thing that actually helps you to um, put like kind of articulate the change that you want to happen in the game and, and position it in the future, which is particularly good in ongoing if you're playing more than one session, I think. Um, and another thing I do at the end of the game, I guess, is that if any safety tools have been activated or I have any concerns about that, that would be a kind of probably a separate off-camera connection with that um, person to make sure that um, everything is okay, which Sid has also shown me how to do nicely when I X-carded a thing in his game and, and freaked out a little bit and he looked after me really nicely um, afterwards. So that is now part of like how I would do like the kind of end of game and aftercare 
Um, let's pick on Barry, <laughs> who um, off camera did say that he is also a, a newbie when it comes to the end of game stuff a little bit. But yeah, what what would you currently do? Sure. Um, well, I'm well, I'm actually uh, fairly new to the gauntlet as well. Um, and so having watched a few APs um, before getting into my first game, I was like, I was that one of the things that really got me excited about playing with folks in the gauntlet was seeing like how willing people were to kind of um, like check in after after play. Um, and that's something that like I've been in a long standing uh, face to face group. And like culturally with those uh, long standing face to face groups, it's like, I don't know if that's something that we kind of take for granted. Uh, and so from a like from a play culture standpoint, it makes a ton of sense to uh, to use tools like this when you have a when you have an open table. And that makes just as much sense when you're um, you know, when you're adding people in a in a face to face group in a um, uh, in a in a, a social situation like that. Um, so so as far as as far as what I'm doing, I'm like I'm I'm really here uh, with kind of two things in mind. One is like, how does the how does the GM get started in doing something like this? And then secondarily, um, how can I as a player uh, solicit feedback about my play um, in a way that isn't going to that isn't going to like I uh, like I don't want to make someone uncomfortable uh, by you know, by asking pointed questions about like, well, how did what I did uh, in the game, you know, make you feel like, did you, are you responding to this? Cause like, I'm not, I'm not an actor. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I've been in this hobby for a very long time and I'm still figuring a lot of things out about it. So that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from right now. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I really check into like totally a, um tool that and i see i think can be often like glossed over as a um like as a tool to use and perhaps they're used often like i when i'm running a game i do um you know i'll stop at breaks and ask people if they're having a good time but it's also like people are very rarely gonna be like no i'm having a terrible <laughs> time so i am curious um how to i guess how we use check-ins like well i guess and i know in some of your stuff garrett um about the um the stuff you've written about delegating responsibilities that if you perhaps if you're highlighting whose responsibility that kind of is at the start of the game maybe it's seen to be more important and and that there's somebody whose role that is to be doing check-ins along the way could could be that answer anyway um, do you want to speak next, Garrett? Sounds good to me, yes. So I have, for different types of games, I plan very different end of game parts. But there's one consistent pattern, and that is that I, in 90% of the cases, I mess it up. I don't follow what I planned, <laughs> and I do it differently because I'm maybe exhausted, I'm maybe nervous, and it's it's just another game to play after the games. A role I, ha I have to change my role. I'm I'm transforming myself. I'm getting out of the game, and have to host another event, so to say. And this is what why I try in some of my games, especially those who are more emotionally intense, um, to uh, source that position out at the debrief the feedback is moderated by somebody else and for some of my live action online games the logs i have established that so there's a list of responsibilities and at the beginning there the facilitator can then ask if somebody else would take over that role and there's a text they can read so it's all highly structured so you don't have to invent it on the on the spot as as the moderator and you just play that role. And very important for me is that I differentiate feedback from debriefing, while feedback is like, how can we improve? And 
can we rationalize what we just experienced uh, from the emotional impact? And so I like to have rituals as part of the end of the game. So if we all switch our cameras off, for example, stand up and stretch our legs after three hours, or if we took a break, one and a half hours of playing, that already changes something. If we leave the room we were in, or like as we sometimes do in the gauntlet, that we move to a different space, we stop the recording from the Hangout and move to Discord, for example. These are little rituals which can change the setup and bring us into a different state. And feedback doesn't have to happen immediately. So in some of my debriefs, I recommend that the feedback is something which happens long after, maybe next day. You could ask that people think about what they have experienced before they go back. Maybe it's better to, to take some time and separate your emotional impact of the game from what you just had. However, for sure, there are some games where I, I'm not that worried about the emotional impact, just for example, for my tuk-tuk races. But as Michael Buffett can uh, possibly approve, for, I, the debrief for the tuk-tuk race was that we all read the same poem together. I wrote a little poem that life is not a tuk-tuk race and that we will all make it over the finishing line. And that can also be like, you, you say the same stuff, everybody is reading this poem, but still you're doing a deep breath. You still express an emotion you have because the way you read it tells the others a lot how your experience was and it tells you yourself a lot. So, Let's, I, I stop here now because I'm getting too excited about telling about all the other ideas <laughs> I've tried and tested. But I can tell you, I tested in the last weeks, I tested also roses and thorns and stars and wishes. And it worked as well. It's, it's amazing. So my final point, I think, is the method is not necessarily the most important part, but the welcoming and giving um, nature of what we are doing. And then every me method can be as good as the other. Mm. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure I forget what I said before we went live and what I've said since, but um, that idea of um, kind of feedback and debrief and um, having definitions um, about what they are, like the way that um, I think Garrett's approaching it is that feedback um, is um, focused on the game itself, like on the, the character, I guess, on um, yeah, mechanics and play and events that occur during the game. And then the debrief is about your um, reflecting on the emotional um, impact of that on you as a player. I guess that's a um and i i am very interested in seeing like i understand that you kind of need to keep those things to separate them um in some way but i do definitely want to work towards a point where i'm i am able to do both of those those things anyway i'm gonna um garrett did give me an awesome segue to pass it straight on to michael but instead i started talking myself again so here's michael <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, uh, I'm Michael, and I realize now I'm pretty much utterly convinced that I'm a distant relative of Barry uh, upon seeing his face on the screen. So hopefully we won't get us too confused. Uh, but I uh, have been running games on Gauntlet Hangouts for about a year and a half now, and I started with uh, Roses and Thorns as a debrief uh uh, tool, but I've recently switched over to Stars and Wishes. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, the discussion this evening because I think that debrief is a really cool part of the Gauntlet Hangouts play culture. I think um, the majority of games we see out there are being uh, having some form of debrief. And uh, I've had a hand in uh, assisting some new game uh, masters or game facilitators in the Hangouts. And I would like to know what cool methods um, and in useful techniques people are using so that I can pass that on to uh, more folks and make the Gauntlet Hangouts experience even more awesome. Uh, that's me. <laughs> cool. Hopefully um, 
it seems like there's a bunch of tools and like cool methods getting thrown out here. So hopefully that's exactly what we're achieving here. I'm actually getting really excited as we go along. Oh yeah, V um, points out you sneakily um, tried to get away with not telling us what you currently, oh, that you, you just run regular um, Stars and Wishes? Yes, Stars and Wishes is pretty much uh, it basically. Uh, I did start with Roses and Thorns and um, but now it's just starts some wishes. Um, mm. So interested to hear what I can you add. Also, I have done a off-camera um, X card debrief with me as well. <laughs> one time in one of our games, which we, you were really lovely as well. I, I don't use the X card all the time, but I, I, I do think it seem to be like. <laughs> usually, I just use it when I don't like a name that somebody uses because it's like a name that's already people are always trying to name their characters Rose or Rosie and that's my daughter's name so I'm like hey can we x-card that it's a nice soft one but I think you and Sid are the two um maybe two of the only times I've like freaked right out in the game <laughs> and had to use it like strongly <laughs> I, I remembered that event and I was wrecking my brain to see like oh man did I did I do like Sid and check in with you or not is this am I, am I going to be thwarting myself here for that exercise or not you did uh, but I'm glad that that went <laughs> well for you right cool Sid do you want to um, regale us with your current um, end game um What's the cool word for when you end game thingamajig? That's the I one. I call it end game processes, but that's that's I'm very process oriented. <laughs> it's very yeah. dry. Someone think up I, a better marketing term for it. End game process yeah. sounds like uh, getting ready to die. Yeah, that's when we're turned into sausages. Yeah, I'm going through my end game processes. <laughs> I'm moving into the soylent phase of my life. Um, <laughs> so uh, I I do two very specific procedures um, or processes. Uh, so there's feedback and debrief, which which we're all kind of um, collecting into this end game process sort of thing. Um, debrief is definitely my end game thing where I use stars and wishes. The only big difference I do with it is I tend to ask people to restrict themselves as much as possible to like a single star and a single wish. I think that um, I think that having scarcity makes those important. And I think it's very easy to be like, star for you, star for you. You get a star. Everyone gets a star. Um, and I think I think that that choosing someone um, makes us really um, makes it really considered and really intentional. Um, and then uh, I also like that people then break that and and just choose not to. And I think the transgressive nature of telling everyone how good they are is also fun uh, for people. I do um, that every time. I'm like, and you get one, and you get one. Okay. <laughs> and then I and then I separate. I have I have game feedback and I have safety feedback and I and I keep them separate because I think they are different things and I think they're affecting different parts of our of our play experience. And then I have this other type of feedback which is consistent and constant throughout the game. Um, I I personally and I encourage my players and my play cultures to um, be really vocal about feedback throughout the game to throw thumbs up to screens and to and to put in chat how good things are and to like really keep their feedback um, both positive and negative rolling right throughout the game so that we're constantly saying to people we're constantly um, aligning um, people's expressions with our um, with our response to that expression um, I think it was uh, Barry mentioned something about um, wanting people's feedback about about their behavior, but not being the actor sort of thing. I, I, th I think that that um, we should be providing that feedback to each other, especially when um, compared to a lot of table environments, we have this chat system, which is perfectly there for us to have the meta conversation of, I like the play that you are doing while I, I'm as a character playing off you and saying, I hate you. Cool. Um, yeah, I think um, oh, I totally lost what I was going to say. You said so many good things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I really like that um, that idea about um, 
yeah, the scarcity, I've noticed you doing that, but I didn't know exactly why you were doing it. So it's cool to hear the, <laughs> like, you only get one star to give to, like, any of these four people. I do kind of, I like that. It's um, interesting to hear your rationale behind doing that. Um, v? Yeah, I'm V. So I guess my unique perspective into this is more, I come at it from more of a game designer perspective. I'm really interested in how these sort of safety tools can be formalized, formalized in a game system. So like that's a particular interest of mine. Um, but of course, as a GM, I, uh, I've been doing feedback and debrief um, for several years. But my, I mean, it was interesting because Garrett said, um, I think it was the definitions of a feedback versus debrief and the separate conceptualizations of those two things. Um, I do very much separate those on a conceptual level, but on the in my practice of this end of session process, uh, I tend to do things, um, tools, use tools that hit both um, at the same time, or most of these tools will have a blend of both of those elements in it. Um, and the way I sort of think about this end of session process for myself is that debrief and feedback have a bunch of aims that I want to accomplish within them. So like debrief is focused around people, emotions and experiences, um, like giving people time to reflect, having uh, people reward good play, validate, thank, encourage each other and on like a friendly social level um, and sort of to be able to get group closure and then, you know, feedback where it's the improvements to the game are more like, Rational, uh, rationalization kind of approach. Um, it is about information seeking. It's about seeking information that can be actioned upon to improve the game or the processes for the future. Um, and yeah, I think it's like, for me, if it's if you're playing a 10 session game, every end of session um, thing will help make the next session better. Like that's sort of definitely the way I think about processes because processes are there to continually be reviewed and tailored to a game group. Um, and yeah, so all the tools, I, I, I like to think of it like I have a toolbox with all of these different tools and I pull them out to apply to different mixes of this these aims that I want to achieve in the game. So I won't use like the same ones necessarily, but often I will use, um, so a lot of Gauntlet games where you're playing four sessions, Stars and Wishes is so great because then you can really uh, seek out those actions and wishes and um, use those to improve the games in the next four session. If you're doing a one shot, you're going to have to apply that differently because you know you can't take the wishes at the end and then play another sessions where you can do the wishes that won't work so a lot of it is tailoring for me tailoring using the right tools for the right job for a real aussie take on it yeah i think um i had um thanks v that's awesome um yeah that's a uh, interesting insight too about um thinking about the tools as a game designer and like how to like support people, especially, especially I think because we're kind of lucky in the gauntlet that that's uh, like is already an ongoing conversation about how we do this and how we look after each other. And like, I guess this is part of that conversation. I also um, just thought of some cool homework for myself, some feedback and debrief homework for how to like you know like take some of this information that just from hearing um Garrett talk about trying out different tools and then UV saying you've kind of got a kit that you pull out for what the particular um occasion is but I've got homework for myself now to maybe try um take away the feedback from after a game and to try you know do that that ritual shut down and um, debriefing and have it, I just have a go at doing the getting some feedback afterwards. I think sometimes I get a little bit funny on the gauntlet about um, because I mean, there's some people that I'm friends with and then I've got lots of warm acquaintances <laughs> as well. And I often feel a little bit funny about respecting people's time after the like after the game? Yeah, Garrett, you'd like to say something? But no need to interrupt you. Let's do. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, that's a great point. And we so great that you 
take that as a responsibility as a game designer to say the game might be over but my responsibility as a, de as a designer is not i don't leave the people alone here now i help them to improve whatever that means improve so i'm like to bring a little bit fire in here and say like what does improve mean anyway so mm -hmm. um I, I surely I get what you mean by improving and everybody should have more fun. The game should be elegant and fluid and maybe some parts don't work as intended. So you want to identify them, etc. But I would add one more detail. Maybe it has to do with the kind of games I run, but I, so more like kind of one shots. But um, we also, we don't only, only play a game and the mechanics and the story we write together, so to say, but we are also human beings in a social interaction, in a very personal and vulnerable social interaction sometimes. So what do we take back what improves our life as human beings? And so, for example, one of my favorite debrief questions, therefore, is go around the table and ask everybody, how can you relate the game and what you have experienced to your real life and what can you take back into your real life in what just has happened in the last three hours. Um, so because that is something people then really struggle to answer, but it also opens their mind to a very different dimension. <laughs> yeah, yes, I really like, I like that. that. Yeah, sorry, did you want to respond to that, V? Um I I am very utilitarian, I think, in what improvement means, uh, where it's maximum happiness for your game group, right? Um, so the most, if you're getting your your table to be the most satisfied, then then that's like an improvement for me. And and the the difficult part of that question or that formula is um, much like the whole of utilitarianism is the the formula by which you. You get to that because every person is going to be really different and react to debriefing in a different way. Some people really want space. Some people don't. Um, the approaches are very individual. It's very no it's normal to need a lot of time or not at all. Um, but unfortunately, there is a group of them. So how do you weigh up the different considerations? How do you weigh up those things? It can, can be difficult. Um, and I think that's where culture helps. Um, because you build a strong culture, the expectations of the group also um, get built around that as well. So yeah, uh, but you know, I think it's still ultimately, whenever I, I look at my own games anyway, it's about maximizing the happiness of the players at my table for that instance. Nice, I like that idea to maximum happiness slash satisfaction because we have so many people that love being sad <laughs> in their game experience, yeah. that's what makes them happy. <laughs> yeah, but it's hard because satisfaction can mean different things and it can be in conflict. For example, like you want to be satisfied by making uh, relationships as friends on the table, but also mm. maybe it's a safety concern that's going to be the thing that we focus on this. So it's really dynamic. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, halfway point let's check in with everybody and see how they're all going <laughs> garrett you'd like to i i'm i guess i should say um i it's funny that we don't do um use our safety stuff i was thinking about whether i should do a safety thing at the start of <laughs> the doing the conversation just because we don't all like know each other and so i guess um I guess, I mean, a check-in is a pretty good safety tool in a conversation, right? I'm trying to look and make sure everybody looks happy and that they're having, and I assume you're, oh no, Michael, <laughs> that um, I assume that you're all also kind of um, looking out for each other um, as well. I guess, um, Garrett, you had your, um, yeah, half-time debrief. <laughs> um, Garrett, you, um, you had your, um, cute little hand out there. What did you want to say something? <laughs> you, you can see my my cute little hand not going down anymore if you if you are not careful. Um, everybody else, feel free to um, wave, and I'll try to tag you in if you've got a desperate idea you'd like to share. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I have occupied enough space. Ah, uh, yeah, Michael. Uh, I was just gonna say. Uh, one thing I'm really interested in, here's my wish for the second half of this uh, panel, uh, at least 
part of it. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about why it's so important to separate feedback and debrief, because this is something I've been mixing together and not, and I had heard some feedback from some people that uh, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. And I was kind of uh, curious about why that was and how I could improve in that area specifically. So the separation of feedback and debrief. Yes, that's exactly why I'm here too, Michael. <laughs> because this is a new learning thing for me, just even having the definition of them or even just yeah, thinking of a definition of them as separate things as a way of, of yeah, defining them is a new thing to me. And and why why like is it important to have have them as separate um, concepts and why? Um, let's we haven't um, picked on Sid for a while. Do you have any thoughts about that? I can see you thinking about it, Sid. I think feedback and debrief aim to achieve different things. I think that feedback is about um, the is toward the game. I think that feedback is about um, improving the game, changing scenes, mm -hmm. um, developing how you play together next time. And I think debrief is about moving away from the game. It's about leaving that space. Um, I used to play. Uh, I, used to, I used to have a weekly Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition game. And two of the guys, uh, so we at the end of the game, we would all do feedback. And feedback was, oh, wasn't it cool when you did the thing where you hit the orc with the axe because that's pretty much all you do in D&D? And I was like, yeah, it was great. It was a lot of fun. And then debrief for two of the guys was they would go outside and they would rip cones and, and just enjoy each other's company, right? And that was, um, for anyone who is an Australian, ripping cones is enjoying the devil's lettuce through a, uh, a smoking device. Yeah, smashing a bong is another smashing way. A bong. <laughs> <laughs> and they would, and they would um, just enjoy themselves and, and be in each other's company. And that was their debrief. They'd spend 15 minutes doing that after every session. And I, and I think that is the difference for me, is that um, if you're trying to smash feedback and debrief together, you're going to get this push-pull where some people are going to be trying to step away from their game and the character and the feelings, and some other people are going to be trying to push them towards and be like, do you remember this? This was good. Feel this again. Get excited about this. Yeah, that's the kind of feedback that I am naturally inclined towards wanting to do. Like, hey, guys, remember when we did that? Wasn't that a cool moment? I loved this. Did you love it as well? <laughs> like, that's actually what I just thought you were meant to. I understand, like, I'm a, a quite a caring person and I want to learn how to make sure everyone's, like, happy and good after the game. But I guess for me personally, most of the time, I feel like I'm totally, like, happy with that as my as my feedback or even maybe as my debrief but I understand that that isn't a thing that necessarily works for um for everybody um does anyone else have a answer or a reflection yeah on that that idea of why we need to separate um those two things yes Gareth different dimension so I I totally agree and the, the different dimension I have in here is that I'm also highly utilitarian in my thinking, in my, in, in my thinking, in my upbringing. And also I'm judgmental to myself. And so I like to carve out moments in my life in which I don't do that. And for me in games, this is an opportunity for me playing games. This play to lose concept, this um, I'm there for mutual entertainment and we just do something together and this is not for maximizing anything. Not even fun and um, not even understanding, not, not even improving. This is, there's just a moment where I can escape from this. I'm bad at that and this is why I like to have my little rituals where I still can do that. And um, this, this, this is for me a different dimension, another dimension. And a second point I definitely, I brought up in my blog post from Friday, by the way, and on the Gauntlet blog. Um, it is something I once read Which on the internet. We will, um, we'll drop the links to that, both yeah. your um, post and my stars and wishes one in the um, description. Yeah. 
So the, the other point is like the, um, the amazingness imposter syndrome. So we easily, when we do stars and wishes, are all getting very excited how amazing and fun, wonderful the game is. And we see like it is kind of a duty also to those who made an effort to organize that to show them how great it was. And there is a benefit in that. But it's also a risk that if you don't feel that, that you have to fake it if you were not that excited. And that is a troublesome position in that you are in because we shouldn't force anybody to fake excitement. And having a moment where it's explicitly not about the excitement, but about introspection, about your current state of mind, that's difficult to achieve. And I've nearly always failed to do that, but I try. <laughs> and um, this, this imposter syndrome of take, of, of that every game has to be super exciting is something maybe that also comes from my German heritage. <laughs> um, that we are a little bit more critical sometimes and not always helpful in the sense. So I very much enjoy that everybody is like enthusiastic, but sometimes it's also good to have space for not being so overexcited. Mm, like, I, sorry, oh, yeah. you go. You're right. Yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> uh, Mine the was way... just a passing thought, so you seem like you've got a cool thought. Um, I think the way that I, you know, deal with that, like, um, especially in a group when everyone's excited, um, it's actually, I think, a proven thing, I'm going to say, but, you know, one of those studies show that if you're in a group and people have certain opinions, that you're more likely to join with the group rather than think about your own thing. Um, so I think a lot of people, especially people who don't jump straight in, who uh, like to hear other people's opinions first, in particular, it's good to give those people time to think their own thoughts. So what I like to do at the end of the game is once we finish like the, the game part, but before we hit the end of process is to actually schedule a break there. Right. And I think a lot of people have said that they do this. Um, I mean, I say, you know, like we're going to take a five minute break now when we come back. We're going to do X, so we're already setting expectations of we're going to do stars and wishes, we're going to do roses and thorns or whatever. Set expectations so that they can think about that in the break and then encourage them to write their own thoughts down. They don't have to say what they wrote down, but if, you know, then they do stars and wishes like normal on camera, but then if they've written something down or if they've thought about what their own opinions are, at least they'll know that later in terms of as a person themselves, they can process that. So that, that's sort of how I deal. That's like my middle ground. Uh, I know that's not a way for letting them voice their opinions, but maybe they can message me privately afterwards if that's really the thing they want to do. Yeah, that does actually. I'm glad I um, held on to my other thought that I had because I was just thinking um, based on what Garrett was saying, like about that, um, that we don't always have to love the game or... <laughs> whatever and that it's perhaps unfair for to expect that of um people but i was thinking like in some games like i'm often like excited when i turn up and then you know i sometimes flatten out and i'm like why am i playing the game i don't know if i really want to be here today and then i try to be excited <laughs> And then I'm having like a moment of like, I'm so happy I'm here with all these people right now. I love playing games <laughs> like so much. And, you know, then I'm just having a good time. And but I kind of like that idea that I wonder if there is a way it would be good if there was a moment even of personal reflection during a break. Like, I wonder if you can ask a, a pointed question when you go to take a break, like just have a think about how you how you are feeling right now like in the you don't have to necessarily share it but i think that would actually be useful for me like i don't know it's funny isn't it because people have fun in so many how would you feel barry if i was running a game for you and i um i <laughs> said while you're on your break just have a think about um how you feeling now like <laughs> Would, would that be a useful thing for you? I'm just curious. Well, no, I, I, you were you were saying that, and I was actually thinking about like all the different like all the different things that role playing texts uh, bring to 
uh, the player, like before you actually sit down at the table and, you know, you think about like, what does, you know, what would your character think about all these different like scenarios? And meanwhile, like in play, you have all these real scenarios that are right in your face continuously and no support built into the rules to be like, well, what does, what does this actually, what does this mean for your character? What does this mean for you as a player uh, kind of, kind of throughout um, and I think that there are games that are really getting there with some of those, like some of those end of session, uh, like anything with a playbook that's that has like at the end of session, if you whatever or whatever or whatever, then there's some in game, there's some in game effect based on that. The nightmare scenario of that for me is like getting extra XP for good role playing, which is just not something that's ever going to like that, that never works out satisfyingly, uh, for anyone that uh that doesn't that doesn't get that yeah there's a there's a pressure associated with that exactly um and so i don't know i guess i guess what i'm what i'm like i i'm, I'm thinking about the um i'm thinking about the like the the 10 page backstory and how like you don't want that to happen as a as like a as a response to an in-game like i i need a i need a break to get this uh, to get this fiction out of my head for uh, for what i'm for what I'm thinking about this character, what I'm feeling about this character, but like, uh, I need to be able to write, you know, a, a five sentence thing that I can, uh, that I can use to get out of my head. And then, you know, if that's not feedback that goes anywhere other than I got it out of my head, uh, that would even be like a, like that would be a useful outlet for me sometimes, you know? Yeah. I, um, like I know I've seen you say before, Garrett, that you um you do really like that um very immersive style of um play for yourself that I've I've heard you say that in the past, right? Like you do really like to have full like yeah, like and then I wonder what I wonder what some sort of question as like, hey, in this break, like a mid game step away, if that if that is a a problem for some people do you know what i mean like hey while you're on this break because breaks are like about going and looking after your physical self often right like i wonder if there is a place for that being like step away for a second and make sure that you're like having a good time here and you know that you are you're feeling good and you still i don't know yeah i'm just pondering but does that how would you feel about that like uh being requested to jump out of character in the on a break or something like or is that a thing that would work or be a thing yes uh, i mean we in the chat which you can't see we were already mentioning larp has like is so much so so far ahead on tabletop role playing culture i think tabletop needs some other tools online play needs some other tools we need to find our own way but there's so much we can still learn from what is happening in larps especially in like Nordic Blob and American, American Freeform, so on. And like, um, for example, one technique I really like is that when you put your hand on somebody's shoulder, you're immediately out of character and you can do a check-in in the middle of the most in intense scene. And I have experienced that myself. It doesn't end the immersion. It doesn't end the amazing experience you can have. You can easily dive back into character afterwards. That's my experience. So there's there's there yeah. need, don't really need to be any fear of that and being. This, yeah. This so way. this is a thing that um like children do constantly when you watch them play. Right. Like they're very easily able to come in and out of what is the game and have then just suddenly be out of it. Like I think they, I forget, I I studied this, but there's a kind of defining the space that the game happens in, and they kind of do safety stuff. They're like, hey, does that stuff? like no, that's too scary. I don't want that in the game. Can we not have that? And you know, if it's your main cousin, they'll be like, no, we're having the scary thing. But most of the time, you know, kids will be like, okay, let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah, and. and to just to add to that, and, and one of the best models also comes from LARP I have is that the, the game is just the, the actual part of the play, what we consider usually as the game, but everything around it 
is at least that the Knutepunkt Convention, I had this one wonderful talk about it, it's like an onion model. There are so many layers around it. You buy the book you, of the game you want to play, you read it, so you already start playing. You think about who you want to play with, you do workshops and you consider what could happen in the game. Everything is part of the game and therefore also everything what happened afterwards. Take it seriously and consider it like a fluid process. And that helps a lot also for, for like thinking about what the debrief is there for. Because it doesn't have to be over when it's over, the debrief. You can continue thinking about, you can dream about what you had. You can enter a one-on-one -on -one con uh, conversation about the game afterwards. I've done that with a lot of frustration after a game. I went to one of the gauntleteers who was in there and everybody's open-minded to talk with you about it. And that feels good. Make your own debrief. When, when you have a GM who doesn't do a debrief, do it by yourself. It helps. It's fun. Yeah. It's it is fun. That comes back to like what I was, I think I'm um, still a little bit funny about encroaching on people's <laughs> time. I have this funny thing where like, that's why I want the feedback after the game, because I'm a bit shy about approaching people afterwards for stuff. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just, maybe I should, I mean, there's obviously a happy middle ground, right? where I'm not writing to them like every hour for the next week. <laughs> where well, it helps like, hey. It helps both the GM, I guess, if they say, you know, uh, I'll be available after for the next week and time box it for themselves. So then you know when to contact them. And they also are like having a million things all the time. Like they just know I've set up, how, how long do I have, you know, spoons for? One day, two days. They said they, if they tell you at the end of the session, then you know when to contact them. And they also know when you would contact them. And so I think that helps. Yeah, cool. You can do by set, setting expectations. So just so people um, watching know, if you're still watching, thanks for um, hanging out with us. Um, we've got a very massive list of things that we've pinned in the <laughs> ideas that we've gotten excited about as we go along. So I'm going to make sure I take all of those um, with us when we um, when we go and hopefully we'll it sounds like we might have other things to discuss <laughs> in the future I, and this is actually um, being it, this is exactly what I was hoping this would be that we're just like look at all these ideas <laughs> and get some new ideas and um, yeah, does anybody um, have anything that they would really like to talk about that we haven't had a chance to yet? Yes, Garrett, this is why you're on this. <laughs> There's one part of feedback we haven't talked about that much yet because it's also sensitive stuff. It's GM style. It's how good is the GM in terms of being the eloquent, fantastic person with the amazing ideas and having 10 different NPCs already in their head and, and so on and so forth, which is sometimes not the case, can happen. And um, how do you get GM feedback? And Rich Rogers is really tough on himself getting all the feedback in. He likes to get it. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how, how he's doing that. And um, he's really taking it in. If somebody says, you didn't give me enough spotlight, you promised me something else, he wants to learn from it. But not everybody is like this. Not everybody is so tough on themselves. So like one thing I pro pro proposed in one in my recent games is that you announce, if you're not that tough, you announce a person who others can bring their feedback on your GM style to, and they will rephrase it in a way that you will still be able to learn. So you have a person in the middle who was also in the game, who understands. And you know who that is, you ask the person for sure if they are okay with that, and then you can have your feedback in a focused manner without having any bad feelings towards one person <laughs> who is just bringing the message. Yeah, that's yeah, really that's, cool. Yeah, it is really cool, isn't it? I kind of like that. Yeah, I don't think I, um, I feel like uh, there's just so much to like take away from like, it's such an intense thing running a game. I guess you've got so many things to think about. And it's um, like, I often, I have so many things I've noticed myself that I already <laughs> want to improve that I often don't seek out that I'm like, oh, I can't improve 12 things at 
once and I noticed like 12 things that I could have <laughs> done better already. Like, I, yeah. Uh, um, do we have any other? Um, we're approaching um, with the hour now. Yeah, Sid? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to lean into this questions thing and I'm going to offer some questions, but not but not answers. And I, I kind of want just people to ponder these in their own time. Um, my first one is, um, why is it the the GM who's always running our feedback and debrief sessions uh, in the gauntlet? Um, my second question is, should debriefs be opt in or opt out in your games? And my third question to you is. Does it matter if we don't do debriefs? And and I think um, the first one is probably the most interesting to me. The second one is probably the most useful. And the third one is probably the most important. Um, and, and, I, and I don't have answers for any of them. But I do know that if I ever play a game with V again, I'll be asking V to run my debriefs for sure because she's just so much better than me at it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And two of those questions were um, things that I had, a, like, uh, very close to things I'd initially written down, like, to come into this um, with. So I think they're really important. And um, just, yeah, an hour isn't a very long time to cover all of these, is it? So, like, I think maybe I'll, um, yeah, bring those in when some or all of us um, <laughs> do this again in the future because that, yeah, Michael? I was just going to ask, Lou, can you, like, post an event on Gauntlet Hangouts where you continue this discussion at another time that we could yeah, sign totally. up to do? Yeah, I realized very early on that that was going to end up being a, <laughs> a thing. Yeah, I, and I'd love to continue it. Like, I really want to try out all the these different things too, like, you know, like delegating um, debrief is cool. Like there's, I, yeah, there's so many different things to try out. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, let's definitely continue with it. Um, I feel like we need to do something um, fun at the end of this and interesting. Does anybody, yeah, V? No, I was, I was, that was just excitement. <laughs> I thought you would have had an awesome no, idea. I know, I shouldn't have Impromptu just waved so much. Dance. Continue. Impromptu yeah, dance that was my party. <laughs> Flash mob. Um, <laughs> thorns. We'll all give each other really nasty thorns. Um, yeah, maybe takeaways, like, um, which I guess we, we can frame as stars, but if there's um, one one thing that excited you about this conversation um and um then i guess a wishes way that you could frame it is um something that you're excited to talk about in a future um conversation yeah jump in barry um well what uh i think sid was saying about uh the uh scarcity uh of uh, positive feedback, making something or like using that as a way of emphasizing and making that feedback um, like not, I don't know, the, the, that the scarcity brings importance is um, like, that's something that I struggle with because like, I'm just like a big emotional, like, oh, everything is awesome. And I love to, I love to tell people great things about the things that they're doing. I want, like, I want to do that. Like, uh, I want to I want to cheerlead the things that my that my friends are doing that the that my warm acquaintances are doing that the, that I'm seeing like in the spaces that I want to operate in like that's that's what I want to do but like I kind of see how like how not like with not to say that like withholding praise is the way that I want to go about it but like I don't know like using using scarcity as a um, as a as a as a tool to sharpen the feedback is kind of what I'm kind of what I'm yeah thinking. I, yeah to focus it I, I like that idea too uh, Garrett yeah so since it's my 
my favorite debrief question is like, if I, can I relate to real life <laughs> from this discussion? And so I can avoid talking about content, which I'm too tempted to do anyway. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a gentle round talking with you online over oceans and on different continents um, in, in, in such an open-minded and aware matter of what everybody's needs are that I feel much better now than I felt before the discussion and I'm thankful to everybody and no matter what the topic is I would discuss with you again. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, I'm going to um, not say anything about the content now either. I'm going to tell you what my favorite word is instead, um, which is sussurus. Have you guys heard of that word before? It's the sound that um, the wind makes when it moves through the grass or the leaves. So either give a star um, or a wish or now say your favorite word. And I feel sad that you've missed out. You're up, Michael. <laughs> For me, oh, well, um, the scarcity of choice is so challenging. Uh, but uh, to debrief, um, I'm feeling very uh, forward focused, I guess. I'm feeling very optimistic. I'm looking into the future. I'm sitting with some some great questions on my heart that I think uh, I will be pondering a lot in the future. Um, I'm very glad to have had some actionable ideas brought in here, but I think there's also going to be for me some yeah introspective introspection in the future, and I'm pleased and looking forward to that. You're up, Sid. For me, uh, I think the thing I'm going to take away is this this idea of presenting questions to people for them to ponder in their own space. Um, the journaling thing V was talking about, I think, was was really um, interesting. And I'm going to kind of look at um, low barrier to entry ways of doing that and high effectiveness ways of doing that. For me, which is um, uh, Luke, uh, who's at Games from the Wildwood on Twitter, made a comment that um, Thorns being able to say no to people and being able to tell people you didn't like things is really good consent practice. And uh, and I wish we had the space to really like drill into the validity of telling people that we don't like things that they do and how important that is. Um, and, and it's it's um, it's unfortunate that we, that we don't have time to hit everything that's important, but that is one that I would like to talk to people about sometime. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a good one. I think I feel so um, confident telling people when they do things that I don't like that I um, sometimes don't realize that <laughs> that's not a thing that everyone can um, do easily. Uh, v? Yeah, I think my takeaway on this is really how ready we are for this sort of discussion to take place and how uh, how much everyone cares about improving their craft, which is a really great um thing to see because it, it makes me excited about the fact that um, we can work together to sort of uh, think tank better, bigger and better than any of us individually. So yeah. Awesome. Well, um, thanks everybody um, for this conversation. It's been really good. And I'm um, feeling um, really happy to be part of this community and a special thanks to um, Sid again, because um, just playing with you has um, like helped me to like head in the direction to be pondering um, stuff like this, I think. So that's, um, that's been really lovely. Um, yeah, hopefully, um, not even hopefully, we will do this again and I'll, um, I'll go away and um, look over this stuff later. But yeah, thanks. And I um, hope you all have a lovely con and bye to anybody that, um, was hanging out here too. And Garrett, let's talk about um playing um tuk tuk. <laughs> tuk tuk. <laughs> okay. In 30 minutes from now, the next race. <laughs> Sweet. Cool. All right.